Thank you for joining us virtually at Racialization and the Media from Television to Twitter for the final public session of the conference, um, our keynote address by filmmaker Cheryl Dunier. A little housekeeping. For your awareness, this event is being recorded and will be posted on the Ruthermere American Institute and Torch websites following the event. Pose any question using the Q&A tab at any time, and these will be addressed at the end of the talk. Please keep questions as concise as possible. The Q&A will be moderated in line with our community guidelines, and we request that you engage with that space respectfully. Questions will be visible to all attendees. Closed captioning is available by clicking on the box labeled CC at the bottom of your screen. This feature is provided by Zoom's auto transcription and is roughly 80 to 90% accurate. We encourage you to tweet about the session using the hashtag RATMC and tag at racemediaconf. Please allow me to introduce your chair for the session, writer, film curator, and PhD candidate in communication and culture, Natalia Hunter-Young. Welcome and thank you for joining us this evening or afternoon or morning, wherever you happen to be. Um, at what is the final event of the Racial Racialization in Media Conference hosted by the Rutherford American Institute and the University of Oxford. My name is Natalia Hunter-Young and I'm joining you from native land in so-called Canada where I work as a writer and film curator and where I am a PhD candidate writing a dissertation on aesthetics and black visual culture at Ryerson and New York Universities. This evening, it is my great pleasure to introduce the conference's keynote speaker, filmmaker and scholar, Cheryl Dunye. Following Cheryl's lecture, the two of us will have a brief conversation before turning to audience questions. So please do make use of the Q&A feature. Dunye is a director, producer, and writer whose work frequently touches on themes of race, sexuality, and gender, and intersectional identity. Dunye emerged as part of the queer new wave of young filmmakers in the early 1990s. Her feature film, The Watermelon Woman, won the Teddy Award for Best Feature at the 1996 Berlin International Film Festival. In recent years, Dunier has applied her filmmaking talent in television, first by joining Ava DuVernay and Oprah Winfrey for two episodes on season two of Owns Queen Sugar. She has further worked on Claws for TNT, The Fosters for Freeform, The Shy for Showtime, Star for Fox, Dear White People for Netflix, David Makes Man, Love Is, and Delilah for OWN, All Rise for CBS, and Lovecraft County for HBO, for which her Strange Case episode received a 52nd uh, NAACP Image Award nomination for Outstanding Directing in a Drama Series. Dunye is the founder of Jingletown Films, a production company focused on providing a platform for storytellers and filmmakers that identify as people of color and are queer. Please, please welcome Cheryl Dunye. Hello everyone, thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you um, for organizing this. It's such an important um, conference topic and you know, it really falls in line with everything that I believe in um, and am about and, and, and work on and do as a filmmaker. So um, uh, let's bring up my um, PowerPoint and uh, we'll kind of jump into it. So, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about something that's dear to me, obviously. Um, uh, well, not obvious, but um, uh, Black, butch, lesbian representation in film and television. And um, I chose that because this is an identity that I, you know, uh, embody um, and many others. And I, I also feel like this is an identity that, um, you know, needs uh, a little bit more um, uh, work on, 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 on its visibility in the media. So let's just start with some terms um, before we jump into the, the PowerPoint and my presentation to, to define uh, what these terms are on. So um, let's start with representation. Um, throughout cinema history and cinematic re representation um, of black, lesbian, and gay, and bisexual, and transgender, and intersex, and plus people, uh, individuals have been informed by basically the white LGBTQI plus uh, supremacy. Um, but it's uh, representation, you know, is something that has long been an issue in all films for all representation of, of, of others and othering. 
So the, the term representation has been you know, defined in a variety of ways. Um, one literally means representing um, as say in art and philosophy, or another way is uh, differently put that othering um, is another term in there that refers to the, uh, the, um, the, uh, the oppressed subjects and the reproduction of them. So um, that's just a little housekeeping on representation. Um, let me jump into the word butch. Um, butch, I believe, is a, an abbreviation for butcher, uh, an American slang term for tough kid, um, which is something that came up in the early 20th century and was inspired probably by Butch Cassidy, that character. Um, uh, by the 1940s, the word was used to describe the aggressive or the macho woman. Um, butchers were in part inspired by the 19th century uh, cross-dressers, then called male impersonators or transvestites. Um, who presented and lived fully as men in an era when passing was uh, uh, crucial and tactical, uh, some, uh, something to live by. Um, we can think about people like Gertrude Stein and Romaine Brooks who were doing this, but from the earliest incarnation, butches uh, were faced with brutal uh, discrimination and oppression, not only from outside their community, but also from within. Um, so that's butch, but then let's think about blackness, right? Um, black is associated with power, is associated with fear, mystery, strength, authority, elegance, formality, death, evil, aggression, rebellion. You know, black is required for all other colors to have depth and variation of hue. The black color is the absence of color. Um, black is a mysterious color that's typically associated with the unknown or the negative. The color black represents strength, seriousness, power, and authority. And black is a formal elegant and prestigious color. Authoritative and powerful, the color black can evoke strong emotions and too much black can be overwhelming. Um, and you just kind of think about all these things together when you think about the black butch lesbian um, and her representation. And, you know, uh, we can move to the next slide. Um, one thing I'd like to posit is can a black butch lesbian um, exist or even be a superhero, right? And I'm gonna just dip into my own crystal ball of, of memory and, and, and stuff and you know think about it. Because if you ask me that question when I was young, I would say no, right? Um, when I first started to make work or think about making work or just start looking at, at, at television as, in the seventies as a kid, there were very few rep, you know, representative images of myself. There's maybe like a Jodie Foster film or um, you know, when I started to you know, look at uh, media and the newspaper as a young being and not really understanding it. There were images like the one on the left here, black and, 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 and butch and didn't quite understand that. Um, and then when I started to dig into um, television and, and cinema, I came across uh, something that was quite disturbing for me um, and I, I knew that things had to be corrected. It was um, a film that Pam Greer uh, starred in called Coffee, one of my favorite films. Um, but this is how a black butch was uh, presented in the film. Uh, can you play the clip? The context of the film is uh, coffee's, um, Pam Greer's playing coffee. She's impersonate. Oh, that's uh, the next clip, uh, which is not my clip anyway, it's just something on YouTube. But um, when I saw uh, Harriet, um, who's gendered he and she um, as the, you know, the pimp of this woman, um, she's not giving, I, I looked her up and she's not even credited in the film. Um, the, the, the white woman is uh, obviously Pam Greer's, but this actress Harriet is a mystery. Um, so I was like, what's going on? You know, I just didn't quite understand why this person is not credited and, and what that meant for, for them to give their work and give their label and then kind of define such a representation uh, and then play this character. So, um, you know, those were some of the early images that I saw, right? And uh, it took me, you know, a while to kind of address that um, as a young person, um, you know, so one of the first things that I did, I, I, I grew up in um, Philadelphia uh, I was born in Liberia. I grew up in Philadelphia. My father was an African and my mother was an African-American. And um, so being African and African-American 
I was always an outsider to both kind of cultures in a way. So this marginality allowed me to kind of have a kind of dual lens and, and look into cultures, plural, and try to see myself there, which I didn't see myself in, in either one. Um, so my first thing was to kind of figure out how to come out to my family, to my first circle. And so I, the first project for me was coming out and wasn't a, a difficult thing. I was always out really, I just had to say it. Um, the second thing was figuring out my blackness and coming out as African American or what you know I would call American blackness um, uh, or, or United States of American blackness, I have to be very specific, um, which has a long history. And I was able to figure out, uh, I, I had dreads, I, um, was vending jewelry on the street. I was not yet making work, but I was sort of trying to figure out what my relationship as an African American or this translation, of, even though I was born in Africa, but this re sort of translation of it as a, you know, a, a young being in Philadelphia who's trying to connect with community and figure herself out was. So that's where I kind of jumped into my blackness. And the third project for me was like how to put that into who I was. So I started to research. I looked you know, in books and, and at more media, and, you know, came back across this uh, coffee again and, and found, I love black exploitation film and there's something in there that I had to play with and, and replay with again later in life. Um, but it, it was not until I read Audre Lorde's Zami that I realized that I can be all three, that I could be black, I could be lesbian, I could be a woman and I could be butch really. And, 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 and they all can coexist at the same time. So hence I started to try to figure out, we could turn to the next slide, uh, how to make work um, uh, and, and, and what kind of characters I wanted to make uh, work about. Um, uh, when I was in uh, undergrad studying at Temple University, um, I you know, had sort of come to terms with trying to figure this out and was uh, being uh, taught by a wonderful woman named Michelle Parkerson who made uh, Storm Lady of the Jewel Box, that film on the 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 left and it was a documentary short subject about uh, a butch lesbian who in the 60s introduced drag queens at a uh, the Joel Brax review and um, when I saw this film I knew I existed um, and I knew what I had to do I had to sort of make work right so I kept on exploring um, 94 will be Goldberg again in a major feature film um, you know, being a, this, you know, butch lesbian or a black lesbian, um, but there was no name for it, you know, um, which got me to thinking like, I need to name it. I need to research this. I need to find it. So um, I couldn't find anything in, in narrative film. I couldn't find it. I looked in African-American um, film history books, um, Tom's Coons, Mulatto's, Mammies and Bucks, which is about representation of, of African-Americans in, in cinema. There's nothing about uh, black lesbian or butch lesbian in it at all. So then I look in the white uh, book, Vito Russo's Cellular Closet, and in cinema, there was no mention of, really of any African-American queers or, or gays or lesbian in Hollywood at all. Um, so led me to saying, if I can't find it, I have to make it. So that led me to make The One and All Woman. And I play not somebody who's coming out, but somebody who already is. Cheryl, a black lesbian filmmaker, trying to figure out who a black mammy is, and you know, it, it led into you know a wonderful um, uh, what I call the creation of the Dunya Mentory, which is the, a mixture of documentary and narrative, and 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 putting myself in the picture. We can move to the next slide. Um, so I just started creating these stories. If nobody else was going to do it, I was. I was going to represent myself. And you know, is the primary black female butch character, you know. Uh, always having to be a sidekick? No, she could be uh, who she wants to be because the representations that I was seeing in uh, regular cinema still at this time, as we saw in Whoopi's character and other films was, uh, you know, uh, a sidekick, a best friend, um, somebody who's violent with a bottle, you know, anywhere that, you know, or not even included in the credits of a story. Um, uh, you know, my one film was not enough. Um, we can go to the next slide. Um, I, uh, you know, the same year that I made um, The Watermelon Woman, a wonderful film came out called Set It Off. It was a, a male director, a black male director who made it. Um, of, of all the characters in the film, Queen Latifah played Cleo, 
um, a black butch lesbian um, who still the representation was not right, but boy was, you know, this character loved and, you know, loved everything about her, but very one dimensional, you know, based on her sexuality, based on um, sort of being the violent one in this group of four, um, uh, still wasn't right for me. Um, then uh, another uh, couple of years later, a wonderful show called The Wire, uh, also by a, a, you know, a wonderful HBO movie, uh, a series that people just love because of the violence, because of the poverty, and because of a couple of characters in there for me, Snoop and Kamina, uh, Kima, uh, I just fell in love with the show, but also realized there was some one dimensionality within this. Um, these uh, shows were not butch centric, but these butch characters played, please change the slide, um, uh, you know, nothing in the film. Um, so I go into uh, my own mode again after The Watermelon Woman and seeing some of these new images, which are kind of teasing me. They're wrestling with these problems, but the problems are, again, addiction, poverty, and anxiety, self-sabotage, like Queen Latifah was doing. And in short, they, they're, um, they're not fully complex. Um, they're fully one-dimensional. So I decided to make a film about... Um, uh, also being activists, also being political, um, I, I dug into um, a, a situation that was going on where uh, I, I, I know there were a, a lot of women and uh, women who identified as butch and, and lesbian living in an environment. So I go into uh, researching the prison system and um, looking at that population and looking at mother daughters in that population. I made the film Stranger Aside and I made the lead um, uh, uh, an African-American lesbian young woman who is, in ser is searching for her mother through the prison system. And if you hit uh, the, the clip right now, you'll get to see um, uh, the clip of Stranger Inside um, and the power that I uh, tried to uh, create with this film. Um, I wanted you to see the Black lesbian life. I wanted to see the situation. I wanted to talk about social justice. And I think the film um, and the, the talented cast were able to weave that. We shot that in a women's correctional facility and I, I researched with real inmates to kind of create this, this environment. So um, uh, Treasure really embodied uh, what I wanted to do with, um, you know, just hitting it straight on, you know, unashamed, um, young, and um, somebody who's, not only dealing with a system of you know poverty and um, you know the results of, of her predicament, but but trying to transcend that in, in a narrative, as well as having entertainment, as well as kind of flipping what that representation is um, on on its back. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, uh, so representation does this. What we really need to think about, um, you know, is uh, you know what roles are out there for for um, African American. Uh, butch lesbian identities, and they're just not enough. Um, you know, one thing to ask, does the story include a black butch woman in a meaningful role? Those are things we have to kind of think about. Um, does it depict an intersectional view of black female butch characters? Does, do, are they multi dimensional? Next slide, please. Um, and I, I feel that we're, uh, you know, as the timeline kind of keeps moving forward, um, Tasha and the L word, still not there, but sort of answers those questions. There's a documentary called The Aggressives and it was made by a, a, a white man. Um, still not there, but we're seeing a little bit more. Um, and then Leah in Mississippi Damned, uh, Tina Mabry, black lesbian director, got it a bit, a bit right, looking at lesbians and, and a black lesbian butch character in other places. Uh, I'm just kind of pumping through this so we can kind of get to some more questions. Um, the next bit of the slide pre uh, presentation. Um, uh, do the um, black female butch characters have any positive and healthy relationships with key people in their lives? Um, and that's the next element to making sure that black butch representation is real. Does she have a life? Does she have a family? Does she have a backstory? Next slide, please. Um, and by the aughts and uh, is when we actually see in the middle pariah, the first, the second African-American lesbian feature film. Um, and it took over like 10, over 10 years for a second lesbian feature film featuring a butch character as a main character in a film to come out, which is quite some time when so much other representation around LGBTQI characters have happened 
in, in cinema and, and what winning awards in Hollywood and even in shows. Um, uh, Stud Life, um, uh, Campbell X's film um, has a wonderful storyline where a black butch is a lead. And then um, this documentary, Difficult Love, uh, about this wonderful artist, photographer, South African, Z Zemalia, um, is just filled with her life and she continues to make work and, and is um, centered on, on this character representation of being a black butch and well, it's unashamed about it. Next slide, please. So um, the other thing we have to ask ourselves is does the story include at least two uh, named black female characters who have a conversation about something other than race? And um, that's pulling from the, the Bechdel test, but I think we need to use some tests like that, a litmus test, to really to see if there, there is something more than just um, sexuality or desire or violence or they, or they killed off. Um, next slide, please. Um, and we're starting to see that these shows are starting to have um, those storylines. Um, in Orange is the New Black, many characters, um, the same but different, and many characters of documentary. Uh, Bessie, main character, uh, it's questionable. Uh, Queen Latifi again, uh, playing a character who um, has, uh, is a butch. Um, uh, continue on. Um, does the incorporation of social justice themes make black female audience members feel burdened uh, more than seen? And you know that's something that we really need to, um, you know, as as creatives in the industry, um, and and some of you who are out there who are writing about it, we need to make sure that these female members, um, uh, our our characters are really reaching and and doing the work that we need to do by having these um, true life experiences um, and experiences that are involved in not just um, you know a narrative, a drama, a mystery, or or whatnot, but are, are ones that do make a comment about their social justice um, lives or issues or situations that they're in. If we can move to the next slide, please. Um, and then uh, I think as we get to present day, we're starting to see a variety of, 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 of makers and work that really can start playing with genre instead of just having to push Black Witch identity. Um, we have uh, definitely in Master of None, uh, 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 Lena Waithe is, 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 you know, Oscar winning uh, performance for the script and this character in, in this episode where she comes out and generationally in, in this episode and it's just wonderful and funny. Um, the Joel Catch One about a, uh, a uh, wonderful bar in LA that does not exist anymore, but this black witch woman created the bar in the early 70s and we see her whole timeline and what she was doing for the community and it won being an activist piece. Um, and then Kina in uh, Rafiki, a wonderful documentary uh, um, narrative film that talks about black witch identity and love and life in Africa uh, uh, and uh, in an African uh, city. And so that I think we're starting to catch up to the speed if we can uh, jump through um, a little bit more. Uh, so, uh, does the story engender a, a, a versatile view of, of beauty for black butch women? Um, is there a, a range in body types and skin tones and hair texture and natural hairstyle among the black female butch characters? Are they one, one note or dimensional? These are things that we need to really hold a test to. Next slide, please. Um, and uh, I think as we are looking into the, the variety of episodic shows right now, um, in All American, there is, uh, which is a show that's on right now on CBS about uh, football in Southern California, uh, uh, American high school football. Um, the best, uh, the second character, the best friend of the main character is Coop Cooper, and she's a, a, an out butch lesbian, um, played by a lesbian, um, and uh, is also um, a minor character, but her character has a com complexity, her hair is is, is, is in a variety of styles. Um, she has swagger and she is a complete character. Um, the Shakedown in 2018, a wonderful documentary, giving you um, not just the streets, but the, the heart and the passion and the love and the trials and tribulations of, of butch, black witch lesbians, um, as well as a whole show from Lena Waithe called The Twenties um, and Hattie's the main character who is, uh, and it's a comedy and, um, 
played wonder, wonderful uh, by uh, Jonica Gibbs um, and her two straight best friends as they try to find their footing in life, love, and um, the underworld and the, uh, the above ground world of LA. So um, I think once we start seeing A, showrunners um, and creators kind of embody that and, and who are black and who are out and who are butch and who are like Lena, like myself and others, um, start to really you know, have control of the, the narrative, have um, our writing scripts, are or, or, or telling it for ourselves, we're starting to see this change and see more and more representation, but it's still not enough. If we can go to the next slide. Um, and, and then just pop to the next slide because I'm trying to kind of jump to the end. I know I want to leave time some, some questions. So um, in the 1990s, lesbian characters were mainly middle class and white femmes. Next slide. Um, black witch identity is often considered unusual and deviant and wrong. Next slide. Um, and this is what Lena Waithe said, black women who are, I always say, masculine presenting, we can also be soft, we also can be vulnerable, and we are not all aggressive, and this is quite true, and this is why we're starting to see, a, a com you know, th these complex characters exist now and forevermore, hopefully. Um, next slide. Um, so I just wanted to take a look at some of the numbers as well. Gay men compromise 83% of the LGBTQ representation in media. Lesbian characters are about 35%. Next slide, please. There are, uh, the underrepresentation is still there. We still have a lot more work to, to, to do. There's 773 series regular characters, 22%, that's 171 are black LGBTQ characters. Um, and that's been going down. Uh, uh, from this new GLAD representation. So in digging and doing the numbers, we have to keep up on it because yes, there are a few showrunners and shows, but there's still not enough. Next slide. So solutions. Um, one, hire and empower more Black Witch writers, crew, members, producers, directors. Um, green light stories that depict Black Witch lesbians as three-dimensional characters while discontinuing the use of outlandish Black Witch lesbian stereotypes. Um, green light stories that center narratives around uh, outside of the violence of the streets and into the future, maybe, as I can say, Black in the future. Um, and then lastly, I just worked on a uh, project with OWN uh, with a, for a guideline with the She, Her uh, uh, Foundation to uh, give this to showrunners and executives at studios to make sure they're making, can you click on that, please? Um, uh, and, and, and that their, their, their shows really um, address all this in, in just one, you know, one simple document. Um, I, I know it's a little hard to read, but it, you can find this online, but um, our, how to create authentic characters um, and have authentic storytelling in branding um, and have authentic representation. Um, so uh, it, it really goes through with this checklist and it sort of makes it easy for, uh, or easier for, for um, creators and creatives to, you know, make sure that they are, um, you know, um, addressing and, and putting, you know, and, and trying to change things because we need such a change right now. So um, uh, next slide. I want to thank you. I, I, I know I'm rushing through this so we can get to some questions and it, it's, you know, it's quite fun that um, I'm able to talk about something that's so dear to my heart while I'm, uh, you know, uh, so I'm actively working on uh, creating more and more images um, um, out here as a director. I'm making shows and I, I would love for um, to empower you guys to do the same thing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cheryl. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, it's, I have so much more to say, but it's just like, oh my God, I realize it's a, a, a half an hour. And I can't do it all. <laughs> but this is the time for you to say all the other things that you have to say. <laughs> right? <laughs> Um, so, I mean, I might leave my, my comments pretty short, but it, just to rush kind of quickly um, to, to, to start, I guess, uh, what brought me, um, what I thought to kind of reflect on for this was your denumentary approach, which for me raises both like lessons and strategies for grappling with this kind of Euro-American regime of vision, you know what I mean, where like, where that conditions us pretty overtly and how it how, how we see race and how we see gender and how we are able to see sexuality. 
And so you, you know, taking that very literally into the into cinema, um, work against some of those um, boundaries, right? That we have been kind of conditioned to to see within. Um, and so, like the way, so some of the ways that the documentary approach for me really un, un, gets under this is, for instance in The Watermelon Woman, you know, Cheryl, the character, frequently asserting her own creative identity and control over the narrative and representation and like, but in the film, right? And so even, um, you know, asking the wedding photographers to get out of her shot, you know, the control over what that representation is going to be, which I think is quite, uh, quite something, right? In terms of determining the way that, um, to, to kind of asserting, I guess, the, a challenge to that uh, regime of vision, right? And saying that, no, in fact, this is, this is my perspective. Um, and that's an ownership, right? That's not a request. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. And then you, and then similarly, you, you, you know, the developed use of this hybridized documentary form. Um, and like, I'm thinking with your early works here, like she's don't fade per perhaps, um, she don't fade, sorry. Uh, it, it also, uh, for me is a bit like how you bring the background into the foreground, right? And how you kind of um, deconstruct the performance as, as to me, it situates, um, it brings the discussion outside of the film and it forces people to reckon with the constructed nature of, of what we see in our perception. And to me, I think you, you, your work has really pushed back on the frame if, if I can call it that, right? Like push back on, on this construction of seeing. Um, similarly so, um, when, when you allow the audience into black lesbian interior space and which, you know, I think, I hope that the audience feels like privilege to be a part of and to have access to. But at the same time, you don't like over explain and you don't over, you don't provide access to everything. And the narrative that you create is one that like um, forces the audience to observe the unheard por portion of the conversation. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And there's like this, like a, and I think that that really um, changes depending on who's in the seat you know, who's in the audience. So the, the, the like unobserved portion of the conversation could be, you know, could be me watching this and being like, see, nobody ever listens. And that's exactly what I'm thinking. <laughs> right, no, I, I love that. I mean, I think, um, you know, just to jump back on that okay. is, you know, how to create this body of work because there was nothing out there, right? I mean, there was work that was being made and um, in the sense of, you know, some of the, the more, um, mainstream images that I showed, um, but you know, all in the background, of course, as an activist, as an artist, as a black activist, as a you know, queer filmmaker, you know, my work is just showing at film festivals or you know, in, 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 a, in a museum. It was never contextualized um, as one, you know, I, 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 it's not that I had given up hope about making work that would you know, be on mainstream or be episodic or whatever. It was just like, I was making work for us. Right, yeah. you know, for the for, for for my fans, for 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 us to have cinema, um, and it's interesting that right now we're seeing that flip, but we're seeing that flip just go all over the place, and I think it needs to be kind of reined in. I mean, I I, I, I you know, my invisibility was my strength. Hmm. Um, it was an, a power that I had, um, and now that I'm you know working in different worlds, it's it's interesting to see what they want from that in in the context of of, of other people's shows. I mean, I know what I want in my show, but I mean, in other people's shows, you know, they're, they're, you know, what my black lesbian butchness, you know, what my work, what the body of my work, how that plays out as I work on, you know, Lovecraft. I mean, that was, you know, amazing. I was able to dip into all that, uh, you know, history and all that history and all the things I had created to, to put it in the context of somebody else's episode, you know, mm -hmm. they're writing. And it, it came out wonderfully. Um, but, you know, I'm trying to look at these moments where we can actually um, do the two, the, this, you know, do both things at the same time, where we can have work that is political, that is um, entertaining, that is, um, you know, and it's functional for everybody, 
-hmm. And um, I think we're starting to slowly see that happen. It depends on who the showrunners are. It depends on who the studio executives are, but we're starting to see just a small window open up with, with at this moment where we're, we're, we're the junior mentory matters. I mean, the 40 year old version um, uh, <laughs> that uses this format of talking head and, and somebody who's doing it. So, so it's starting to change, um, but again, we, we have a long way to go before we're starting to see these authentic um, voices where people are, um, uh, are able to play with narrative form and as well as have um, queer identities all over the spectrum. Um, uh, empowered and in charge of, of you know, the storytelling. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. I mean, you're making me think about a lot. For me, I, I've heard you say in different spaces that same something similar to that, that that invisibility was your strength. And I think that there's a lot to be said in that statement, particularly now, as it concerns racialization in the media and and thinking about Black people's. Um, representations in the media very particularly and this is like this very we, we are still walking this line where you know um black communities in particular but you know many ethnic groups uh, many racial groups are asking for a particular sort of representation but for black people right we're still contending with this situation of overexposure probably you know to a far more circulatable degree right yeah. um, that we have recently seen, but will continue to see, unfortunately, because of because of the systems and the way that they work against us in our bodies. And so I wonder for you, like how you how you see that within within the industry, but also kind of beyond the industry, do you think what are you thinking about this this complicated line that we're walking around representation and overexposure? Right. I mean, I think we need to turn off the noise a little bit and and kind of create a body of work where we're not seeing the bodies on the ground. No. Um, all the time, um, and uh, and we're not seeing our seeing our, you know mothers crying for their children all the time. Um, we're not seeing this erasure of, uh, and then we're not seeing um, authentic, real violence and erasure. Uh, and we're not creating those images, and mm -hmm. we're not reposting those images again and again. Um, I think what's happening for me is um, going back to kind of looking and and getting away from the kind of TikTok world and the the Instagram world and get back into novels and where our fantasies can take us in, in storytelling. Um, I think th there's a balance uh, in my work or, or, or in my thinking right now is um, I'm so lightly involved in the present. Um, I'm, I'm trying to do work about digging and creating a, a, a new past narrative of who we are. So I'm, I'm thinking about projects and, and you know, pulling the veil off or, or reinventing the past or, or, or just documenting the past about who we were um, as black queer folk. Um, but more importantly, I'm also looking for stories that put us in a future Yes. because we don't exist in a future. And if we're, if we, we know what we look like now and we know what's happening right now. And we, you know, Lord knows how, you know, difficult that is for all of us right now. And, and, and as mm -hmm. creatives, um, as, as writers, as academics, as just regular people sort of living, um, we can go out and protest, we can be involved in the moment and be present now, but we also have to really um, articulate in creating work that, you know, rediscovers and, and reannounces what the past was or could be, or, you know, just make it, right? Or yeah. we start really putting ourselves in the future, which hasn't, there's, there, the future is undefined. Um, so why aren't we building our own futures and why aren't we making uh, bodies and bodies of work that really put, put us in the future? And we're starting to see that with, with writers. I think mm -hmm. uh, a wave of, uh, I think that's where the strength has been in African-American um, and African writing in the last two, three, four, five, six decades has mm -hmm. been the, the black male and female novelists being queer out from Baldwin all the way to, you know, young writers, uh, YA novels now and graphic novels and, and things like that. So, um, you know, Roxanne Gay just doing, you know, killing it as, as, as a writer and as comics and, and whatnot. So we need to kind of you know, fill up the, the art world, fill up the narrative world, fill up the, you know, TikTok world, whatever world, these kind of more interesting images than just reposting 
you know, a meme or whatnot or, or of this violence of the day. I mean, let's, let's, let's shove it, let's kind of push it away. Yeah, yeah, I mean, your, so your approach to going back to the archive um, and, and creating, creating a history in order to, to, to narrate a different story about the present, but also to allow a different possibility for the future is one that is like, is, is, as you say, as you say, quite common or like a, not com common, but it is a practice that I think has been latched onto among African people, African descended peoples, um, black peoples in this like specifically black peoples who survived the middle passage, right? And who have to live in this like constant cycle of having their history erased or um, and their presence erased and their lives erased as, as they try to survive and create futures and understand their past, right? And so there, yeah, there's, a, there's similarities I see in the approach you take, for instance, with the Watermelon Woman to Sidia Hartman's critical fabulation um, and the work that she takes with the archive and, re, and, and, and giving form to the histories that the archive keeps out. Um, wh where do you see, I mean, what excites you about where, where creative, where this creative work is going and particularly these like interventions with histories and projections into the future as it pertains to kind of representations of race, gender and sexuality in the media? I mean, I think it's, um, I think it's, it's, it's broad enough to touch something for everyone. And uh, I think it's accessible for, uh, you know, white, green, red, yellow, gay, straight, you know, trans, whatnot. If, if you, you have, the, I mean, we're all exposed to media. We're all exposed to branding. We're all exposed to capitalism, right? So it's using common themes, uh, archival play um, to uh, kick off something. Mm -hmm. um, that's very personal, that's very political, that's very, um, you know, uh, you know, explosive at the same time. So um, that's what's exciting about archival work. I mean, for example, why hasn't anybody played with um, Uncle Ben, right? I mean, we complain about Uncle Ben on the, the, the box of rice, but who's Uncle Ben's son? <laughs> he could be, a you know, a, somebody really fun, a trans character, and just make him up. You know what I'm saying? There's just so much to be done that um, I think we are uh, wasting time uh, our, our, and our, our, our precious breath to negatively fight the system when we could be using that to create our own images. And that's, that's, that's the kind of, you know, I, I, I do it too, you know, I'm, 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 I'm a victim of that. And once I kind of snap out of it, I get back to my creative, but you know, we fall on these holes of capitalist society and its use of our bodies and this history of its exploitation of black and brown and you know and, and the rainbow of bodies that it spits out and uses to kind of keep the machine going and we just kind of get down but we should just kind of liberate try to liberate ourselves from that every once in a while turn off the noise and make our own noise um mm -hmm. with all with our own instruments and um and see what it gets us mm -hmm. um, and so, very the visibility too i imagine mm -hmm. thinking with mm -hmm. the short films being such an important kind of form for you to, and not just you, but Black lesbian filmmakers across the US, independent filmmakers, um, the short film form tends to, tends to carry a lot of that possibility to create little mm -hmm. kind of time capsules of relation that, you know, we can hold on to and then imagine something different from. Um, Completely. And, and it, uh, I mean, the short film format, you know, which is a form, format that's, you know, Instagrammable, TikTokable, whatever right now. Um, we can make it on our, our phone. I mean, how many folks during the pandemic have made bodies of work um, collectively alone or whatnot? It's poignant storytelling. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, the old venues are closing down, like theaters are closing. Um, you know, everything is streaming now. I mean, the world is changing uh, um, and, and we just need, and we're at the forefront of it. Um, mm -hmm. But again, we should not just let technology rule us in these projects and in these processes, we actually have to get out there and physically do the work. Um, you know, the pandemic is is a global issue right now, and it kind of limiting us on uh, a variety of fronts with our feet and and touching each other. And, and and but we need to get our suitcases packed and be ready to <laughs> to jump on those those places and and kind of communicate in the flesh with people and and do our work, um, as Audre Lorde says. So um, you know, one thing I keep saying is, you know, I'm doing my work. Are you? 
You know? <laughs> <laughs> What's your work, right? Everybody needs to be doing their work. I mean, it's not just, you know, and 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 work takes time. Yeah. I must say, like, you, you know, you could be years thinking about something, but you have to do it. You know, you have to kind of just put it out there, do it, and then move on to something else. Mm -hmm. it, it, like you have to kind of have that click moment or you're just stuck in this you're stuck in this this hole uh, this abyss that this will, will kill you mm -hmm. so that's that's one thing I I, um, I really do encourage people to just kind of you know get over themselves and um, you know kick out their first masterpiece at, or mistress piece or whatever you want to call it and then move on to the next thing Mm -hmm. um and and i think uh once we see you know masses do that watch out the world's world's ours yeah the last thing i'll say before we move to audience questions i think i think what you're touching on here um also makes me think back to the dunium entry approach in um in uh oh gosh i lost my train of thought didn't i really <laughs> let me see if i could get it back in my notes um Shoot, it's gone. But if it comes it's back, okay. <laughs> if it comes back, <laughs> give it to me and anyone you want. I will. Okay, maybe let's go to um, the audience. Um, okay, Cheryl, you mentioned that representation is still not enough. Is there an enough? How do we know when we're there? Um, I, I, you know, I. Uh, that's that's a really great question. Um, I guess we know when we're there, when, um, the num where, where there's, where, where things have evened out, where you don't have to, where you can walk into a room or turn on the channel or open a novel and, and, and to see a, a, a broad variety of everything, you know, where you're able to, to, to just, you know, see a, a leveling off uh, of the rainbow. The rainbow is not a hierarchy. Um, it's not a patriarchy. You know, it's a rainbow uh, of, of who we are and what we want to be. And you're able to just, you know, grab from it and take from it. And, 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 and you'll see that across genre playing. Um, you'll see that, at, at, you know, at, at the smallest image making, you know, say from the TikTok to the, the superhero world. Or a superheroine world, like you, when 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 leads are a variety of people that are black, brown, red, green, and yellow, and they they're out in or whatever they want to be. I mean, we're starting to see a, a little bit of that with the younger generation of the the you know people who are born in, in you know after two thousand. Um, they're starting to really just change, be, uh, identify gender wise as who they want to be. It's, you know, unfortunately, I don't think people have figured out racially how, how people can, you know, be what they want to be. There's a lot of mixed race individuals. I'm, I'm just kind of thinking about these women who have said that they're black and they're actually white and that's a big problem, um, <laughs> right? But uh, there's something that needs to be talked about around that too. I mean, even flip the, the, the switch to thinking about people like um, uh, who've had to be, who are black and have, I mean, you're always black, but um, who try to, get, live in the white world and there's there's a film right there i don't want to go into it I, i'm going to mm -hmm. hold on to that one but i, I, I if we, once we start seeing the kind of um you know the rainbow change um and it, it just you know we can grab onto it in every novel book show um lead you know to minor characters i think i think we're, we're, we're we'll be there yeah, I think what I hear you saying is multiplicity. It's like when you can't just pinpoint what the trope is anymore, maybe then we're there <laughs> like mm -hmm. at that point. Um, it came back to me. I did want to ask you about process work and it kind of will connect, I think. Um, there's a question here about your advice for young filmmakers. And I guess I wonder if in, in your answer to that, um, you can weave in kind of a reflection on process work and the nature of, of the collaborative process of filmmaking when with for black independent filmmakers for queer independent filmmakers um and and in your work in the dunia inventory approach right you you take you you bring the process also to the foreground so you make that also mm -hmm. available and you kind of deconstruct the mystery of behind the screen and i think i wonder if if part of what you're talking about in terms of this making work that is diverse and wild and it's like imaginings 
um, if part of that is, come, comes, comes back to, to this focus of remembering that there's, that there's a process as well that is beneficial and that where things, where the work happens as well and where like thinking and learning and creativity develop. I wonder Correct. if you can, think, yeah. So. Um, yeah, I think that, you know, at least with media and, uh, you know, I, I, media, you, ha you have to rely on other people to help you tell stories, to be a part of that. Uh, you, you can't do it alone. You just can't. Uh, you, you can try, um, but to some degree, you know, I think the more effective work is, a, you know, work that uh, involves um, a producer, a writer, an actor, or whatever, where a whole team has come together um, and has put all their talents together to make one thing happen. And it, it, it takes, again, starting with something small is the best way to do it, but um, it, it's a, it, and, and, and then doing it one time and then doing it again and doing it again. And I also say this to people that, you know, oh, I wanna be a director or I wanna be a writer. You don't have to be that, you know, we need a variety of other people in, in the world of, of storytelling. Um, there's so many people in that collective that make things happen. Um, you can be a producer, you can be a, uh, we need people who are behind the camera. Um, we need operators of cameras. We need somebody who's a great lighting person. We need people who are great at wardrobe. We need people who are good with finance. We need good lawyers. I mean, once you kind of get that together as your crew, like that's that's the you know Tarantino, you know walking down the street team of you know wonder uh, uh, you know the the gang. Now get that together as a gang and see what happens when you have a, a collective that has you know all elements and all bases covered. You can do anything. So it it you can't really sort of do it alone. You can have you know a singular idea, but you you, you need to open it up so other people can be there. And so it can have that force in the world. Mm -hmm. And for young filmmakers who find themselves external to the industry, um, but you know would like to um, can, to continue somehow to influence the nature of the industry and its its failures, essentially mm -hmm. at present. Like you know, what do you recommend for them in terms of in terms of that? Sure, I recommend taking a course, a film course in production, or a film course in screenwriting or a film course and whatever. And why I say a course in production or, or, or for example, it's because you get using the equipment, <laughs> right? You can't go buy that you know, camera, especially if you can't afford it already. I mean, you want something more than your whatever and you want uh, you know, um, uh, an environment where people are doing what you're doing, take a class. Mm -hmm. They'll guarantee you access to that equipment and then tell your story. It's cheaper than buying the camera and all the lights and whatnot. So. That's the number one thing I say is like, all right, I have this short film idea. I wrote the script. How am I ever going to get it made? How am I going to, you know, figure it out? I, I know I can do it. Well, just take the take a class somewhere, anywhere, and you'll you'll get, you know, from a you know community oriented class to a university class, a one off class. You'll have access to equipment. You'll have you know uh, critics right there to tell you how to make it better, and um, you know then you'll have a context and you'll have something made. So that's the number one thing I say is like, you know, find that, you know, class to help you, uh, you know, sneakily get equipment that you can't get access to, especially because it's, I know it's really expensive to get a, a dolly or, a, you know, all these tools to make um, images better. Uh, editing equipment, my gosh, right? Yeah. Do you, um, shoot, again, I mind. Okay, we're gonna go back to audience questions. <laughs> Um, there's a question here. Does does uh, proper broad representation include villains and unattractive characters? Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. I mean, the world is filled with those people, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and we, it, you know, we have to, you know, talk about the world, not, you know, the world's not a pretty place. Um, and, you know, once a villain is not always a villain. Um, so, I mean, I really think we need to show um, and I think there's probably, to me, I would say, in, in kind of writing work, making work for so many years, that there's a handful of characters, you know, there's about seven to 12 character types, you know, the villain, the, the smart person, the, you know, the sidekick, the, you know, whatever they need to be, mix them up, right? So, um, so yes, there needs to be a little bit of villain in, in everything that we do. 
uh, an antagonist can go a long way. And an antagonist is an opportunity to shine light on the protagonist or, or some other spot mm -hmm. uh, 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 that needs light in your storytelling. What I was gonna, what I was gonna ask you while you're talking about film school was, is I read somewhere that um, the watermelon woman kind of began from uh, something you learned in a class or you research you were doing for a course. Is that right? Um, that you were looking into into black into black film history for characters, and that you kind of confronted this. Um, not labeling of characters actually, and that that kind of spawned an idea. It, it I, I think in in my years as an undergrad, getting the book Tom's Coons, Mulattoes, Mammies, and Bucks for a black film course was where I had the text. Now to dig in it beyond, you know, what I needed to do for the black film course to just talk about, you know, black representation in Hollywood. And uh, uh, was one thing, but then to take it out off the shelf again and look for myself in there, and I didn't mm -hmm. even put the two together. Um, and and reading and reading and digging and digging and digging and seeing, you know, no words like in the, you know, the, the table of contents or uh, anywhere in the text uh, that said this woman was a black lesbian and she was a this, you know, that's when it took, you know, I got floored. So. Um, I, I'm always, uh, you know, I'm not going to say once an academic, always an academic, but I definitely um, believe in the academy um, as a place that needs to be um, uh, reformed and change needs to happen in there, but we need to also make sure that we are represented in it. And um, it's a place to get ideas from and um, kick ideas around. Um, uh, and and uh, these ideas can be used in a variety of ways that there it becomes a, you know a armor or or, or weapon used. Mm -hmm. So that's why I definitely feel like it, knowledge is is a, 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 like a, like bullets. Um, mm -hmm. We need to have things to be able to respond to somebody. If we don't have knowledge, um, we're 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 just as ignorant as the people who have those bullets. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that really does help us. Okay, thank you. A um, few questions here. Uh, Cheryl, will you be bringing Gilda's stories to the screen? <laughs> so yeah, um, so again, I, I, as I say, I've been working, you, you, you read my bio and I've been working on a variety of people's shows. It's so interesting about my, my life in episodic I was teaching up till 2017 when Ava said, you know, do you want to do Queen Sugar? I said, yeah. And I was actually at one year away from getting tenure at San Francisco State University. And so I took time off and, you know, I said, to, you know, did Queen Sugar and got another job. And I said to uh, at, on Foster's and then I went back to uh, uh, that was my time off. And I went after that, that break, I talked to my dean and my chair and said, you know, look, I want to kind of keep doing this, I want to see how I can integrate, you know, episodic and some of these folks into the program here. Um, will that work? Let's figure out a course or something that this can happen. They're like, no, we want you to teach this and that. And I said, no, I have to leave. So ever since then, I left and um, I've been working on other people's shows. Um, and it's fulfilling. I, I, I've gained skill set, friends and a talent up my game as a, a filmmaker because I have access to equipment and I make a show, which is basically making a short film or a 90 minute film sometimes. Beginning to end, it's done. I have the equipment tools and it airs, right? Um, but it's still somebody else's film, right? It's still somebody else's story. So um, for years, when I was a baby dyke, baby butch, um, I had read uh, Joel Gomez's Gilda Stories. Um, when I moved to the Bay Area, I live in Oakland now, that, that's where Joel lives too. Um, but when I first moved up here, I started meeting her and seeing her around and I was like, Joel, I want the Gilda Stories, Black Lesbian Vampires, we need to live, we live in the past, present and future. Can I do it? And she was like, oh, I'm, I don't know, Cheryl, I'm working on this, that. And, I, and so I just kept asking her and asking her and asking her and then about you know, a year and a half ago, she said yes. So I've optioned the book. It's my first IP that I've optioned. And me and a bunch of folks right now are in deep talks to, uh, are developing it. 
Um, and hopefully, I, I say that 2022 is Gilda's year. So um, we will see this show, um, you know, start to make its, uh, you know, its mark out there as, you know, I mean, who doesn't love a good black lesbian vampire, huh? <laughs> I certainly do. I don't know. What right? <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see. Um, thank you, Cheryl, for giving love to Oakland by having Jingletown Films here. Are there any projects that you're working on through JTF that you can talk about? Um, uh, I would say um, Beyond Gilda. I've um, been digging into my own work, right? Because um, I think during COVID, the uh, deep part of COVID, I wouldn't say we're out of it yet, uh, the people rediscovered, like it was always there, the watermelon woman in a lot of my shorts. And I was just like, if they're loving this stuff now, why don't I, you know, why don't I develop some of this stuff into, you know, my new show? So um, I'm, re I'm looking, at, people love Tamara and Cheryl in The Watermelon Woman. <laughs> so I've been looking at uh, some, some, some type of Tamara and Cheryl characters existing in, in our world. Um, I wouldn't say that it, it will be a world that's set contemporary, there's a contemporary version of them, but there's also a world that's set um, in The Watermelon Woman's world. So I'm looking at, you know, uh, black lesbian friendships say in the 50s um, and with characters that are, you know, similar to uh, Tamara and Cheryl. I love that. I also love that. Right, <laughs> right, right. My like, my <laughs> internal subconscious, but that right. sometimes is externalized at the wrong time. <laughs> yeah, I can't. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for this and for your yeah. work over the years and for your continued work imagining into um, our past and our future. Yes, um, I must say right now, this one little accolade of, of what I'm working on too, but I think people get a kick out of it. I'm right now sitting in my office at work, working on the Umbrella Academy, season three, the, uh, and a show whose number, the number one person on the list is Elliot Page. And um, I must say that some remarkable stuff is happening here. And I, I really would encourage folks to, to kind of tune into uh, this third season. I think um, these are the things that we need to see happening, right? And, and once I'm, what, now I know, look at this, now I got the skill set, watch out. <laughs> <laughs> Just watch out, it's, it's, it's a done game for uh, what, what's gonna come out of my you know, body of work, out of these stories that I'm looking for to tell on my own. But th it's an amazing show and um, amazing things are happening with, 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 with these characters in this, this world right now. So I can't go into it. Cheryl, thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us um, and for sharing your pathmaking work. Many thanks to the conference organizers as well, particularly Cindy Sage and Isabel, thank you so much. Many thanks also um, as to uh, those of you who took part in this week's wonderful conference panels and to those of you who took out time to join us today. Um, and with that, I will hand it back over to our tech team. Many thanks everyone and take care.